Um, good afternoon, members, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon as we welcome Ms. Natalie Dormer to the Oxford Union. Natalie Dormer is a celebrated British actor, actress. After her debut in Casanova, she went on to play roles such as Private Lorraine in Captain America and Cressida in the Hunger Games franchise. Her portrayal of Marjorie Tyrell in Game of Thrones from 2012 to 2016 garnered significant critical acclaim and international fame. Her career, however, has extended beyond the screen, with turns in Sweet Nothings and After Miss Juliet the Young Vic commanding praise and co-writing the thriller film In Darkness in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Natalie Dormer. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So, Ms. Storm, I'm aware that we probably have some aspiring actors and actresses in the audience with us this evening. So I thought we would start by talking about your journey into the, the acting world. Um, when did you first realise that you wanted to be an actress? Uh, there wasn't an exact moment, but I think I knew as a child. But I always imagined that I would go to university take the sensible route <laughs> and then work that passion out later. Um, but then fate um, conspired and I ended up sort of facing my demons uh, when I was uh, uh, in my late teens. And I had to sort of put my money where my mouth was and decide that I did indeed want to be an actor. And that meant going to London and auditioning for the top five drama schools. But uh, I think I sort of, when I, around that time, so I would have been about sort of 18, 19, uh, 18, and I announced that I wanted to be an actor, I think a lot of people who loved me and knew me very well sort of pretended to be surprised and went, yeah, we know. <laughs> it's, it's just uh, it's something innate within. So you know who you are in this room and your best friends and your parents probably know as well. And the choice to go to drama school, many of your um, contemporary actors that you've worked with um, don't go to drama school, aren't classically trained. What do you think the benefit is in going to drama school and can you notice your colleagues who have been classically trained and those who haven't? Oh, interesting question. Who am I dobbing in? Um, I think it's different for the individual, obviously. Uh, I certainly benefited hugely from three years classical training. And, and, and what is quite an antiquated, you know, theatrical stage training, actually, considering, you know, 97% of your work probably is going to be on the screen in this day and age. The training that I participated, like, that I benefited from, a lot of my tutors were from sort of, had been trained themselves um, at, say, RADA or whatever in the 60s. and. Um, there was sort of this antiquated system that was based on, um, you know, that you would go into rural rep, rep theatre when you graduated. Um, so slowly now, I think, for any of you here who will end up training, you'll have a lot more experience of camera work and so forth. Um, it's built into the training now. But when I went to Weber, who at the, at the time, Weber Douglas was sort of RADA, Lambda, Guildhall, Weber, sort of one of the, those top schools, <clears throat> we had one workshop of camera training in three years. One workshop that lasted four days. And so my early, um, so my early camera jobs, the Tudors would be case in point, probably the strongest example, was two years of what effectively was, you know, six months and six months, season one and season two, of camera training of learning what a set's like, who, what that guy's doing over there, what that lady's doing over there, where to stand, hit your mark, don't look down the lens, what, um, how, how, how close the camera can get to you, what that looks like. It's a completely different beast and creature to acting on stage, which is what I'd been trained at. So before I run completely away talking for a 10 minute monologue, I'm so sorry. Um, for me personally, when I go back to the theatre, I try to do it every five years, but sometimes that's just not possible. When I go back to the theatre, I feel a sense of returning home. It does feel like home for me, and it is still, it is still my greatest passion. I think that's, that's fair to say. There's nothing like being in a room of people, 
feeling their energy, their, them feeling yours, and being part of that communal alchemy that is, you know, mass conversation. And theatre is a conversation. Um, so I'm a romantic about theatre, as you probably just guessed. Um, but, you know, camera is my bread and butter. And I also think really good film can transcend and lives with you and stays with you and can help a lot of people. So um, it reaches people. So there you go. If you prefer acting on stage, um, do you think that going forward you'll do more of it? Or why have you opted instead to do um, you know, five years of film work and then six months on stage and then five years? Of I mean, maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe I'm just being a little billy goat gruff there. And actually, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, I do love camera work. Um, there is some, there you, a camera can get close to an actor's face, can get close to a protagonist and can really get inside. Um, you, can almost, you can see an actor think in close up on camera, which obviously you can't do on stage. I mean, people that are more eloquent than Fiona Shaw and other likes who have spoken, um, you know, on this kind of platform can be much more articulate about the mediums than I can. Um, I do love the interior world for film is really, was a curiosity box for me, I think, when I first started out because I couldn't, I didn't really, um, I didn't really fully understand the power of it. it start, instead, I, until, until I got so far up the ladder that I was starting to be offered, you know, lead roles that really did ex explore the internal life of a protagonist. And then it, that's, it is quite addictive. There's a massive pay gap. Let's be um, realistic about this. You almost have to pay to do theatre. By the time you've sorted out your transport in, your childcare, your whatever, it's just a completely different salary. It's, it's devastating how big the difference is. So um, you have to really want to take time out from camera work in order to afford, inverted commas, to do stage. It's, it's economics as well. So returning to your entrance into the theatre world, you're, after your first job in Casanova, you were out of work for 10 months mm -hmm. or eight, eight to 10 months. Was this period difficult and how does it shape your attitude towards young actors? It was now? horrific. <laughs> it was horrific. I'd been standing, you know, on, this, on the side of canals in Venice, <laughs> being put up in a five-star hotel, working with the likes of Jeremy Irons and Heath Ledger when he was this beautiful star ascending and having lots of fun with my new comedian mates that were playing the lesser, you know, the smaller roles and playing poker till three o'clock in the morning, spending my per diem. And I'd had this most amazing experience. <laughs> and then I came back and um, fate, misfortune, bad representation. I found myself, you know, I've said it in other interviews, I found myself doing data entry and a whole host of horrific things to make ends meet. <laughs> and I, it was the worst time and it taught me, it taught, it was the greatest lesson that you're never home and dry. Don't ever think you're home and dry. But also when it's happening and you're in it, enjoy it. You know, be present, be mindful, which actually is, should be an actor's mantra. You should be in the moment. That is our job. We're paid to be in the moment at any given time. Um, so, you know, but never rest on your laurels and never, and you never know what's around the corner. I mean, a pandemic might come along mm -hmm. and you might not, you know, they might close all the theatres and the cinemas for two years. Who would have thunk it? Um, so, yeah, it, it taught me to be resi resilient and it also taught me, well, if dra drama school had already kind of knocked it out of me is not to take myself too seriously. You know, I think that's the great battle with actors, the ego and the, um, or, you know, the ego, but also the sense of unworthiness sort of goes hand in hand. And it's part of the weird chemistry that makes us vulnerable and yet um, <laughs> exhibitionists, <laughs> which doesn't seem like, it seems like an oxymoron. But um, yeah, that is, um, if you don't ask me to go into the psychology of an actor, we'll be here for hours. <laughs> Did those first few years of looking for jobs give you a sense that 
the adage that acting jobs are dependently the luck or contacts or both is largely true? Or do you think that's become less and less the case across your career? I believe, yes, fortune and luck, being in the right place at the right time, looking a certain way that is right for the zeitgeist. There's so many elements of luck, of course, that, and, and fortune there are. But I also think with determinism and hard work, whatever field you do, whatever you're reading here, way, whatever your plans are for the future, a doggedness of, I, you know, I will, I will, and it's a marathon. I think that stands you in tremendous stead. And work ethic, work. A theatre training, you know, you, they had you in a yoga, they had us in a yoga class by 8.30 in the morning, and we would be working through, and maybe we would have rehearsals, and we'd be finishing at, you know, seven. And, um, you know, shooting and theatre hours, I can go into it in more detail if the questions take us there, but they're long hours. It's an athletic exercise acting. And um, I, the sort of being, um, rolling your sleeves up and um, just being workhorses, I th I've had a lot, I'm not saying this now, I wouldn't dare, but I've had a lot of American directors and producers say to me it's why they love British actors and Australian and Irish because there is a work ethic um, that is that doesn't that doesn't assume luxury or easiness just wants to you know it's the real sort of spit and sawdust still crew for some reason I don't know it's interesting. I don't know. I can't speak to that. It'd be, next time you have a director in, ask them. <laughs> Do you think that partly comes from the fact that British, Irish, Australian uh, drama schools are still much more based in theatre training? Than I in... do. I really do. And that's not to poo-poo Juilliard or the other. I mean, there's some incredible American training. There really is. Um, and I've met some... Of them. But you can... In my experience, I'm going to be careful. I'm being recorded here. I'm going to be careful what I say. <laughs> to all my future co-stars in the future, please don't take offence at this. No, but I, I, I notice a difference between New York theatre-trained actors and ones that have come up through a different route. I do. I see uh, a comradeship in the like. I just had the I just had the I just had the honour of working with Nathan Lane two years ago. And that's a case in point to me. To me, there's no difference between, you know, Nathan Lane and, you know, as I believe you had Charles Dance here a few weeks ago. Um, so I'm not, I'm, not making a, um, I'm not making a nationality difference. I'm just talking about, as you say, hours and hours and hours of voice class <laughs> <laughs> when you want to cut your wrists. <laughs> I, uh, we'll get you to, um, we'll get you to, um, you know, a resilient point by the time you graduate. <laughs> is what I'm saying. We will talk about Game of Thrones a bit more, a bit more later in the interview. Um, but when you're on shows like The Tudors and Game of Thrones, which are so dominated by British and Irish actors, does it lead to a different vibe? Cult, yeah, vibe on set. Uh... <laughs> You know, no two jobs are ever the same. And I, that's one of the great joys of my job. I'm about to go in three weeks to start a job in South Africa. I'm about to go to Cape Town for three months. I've, uh, I, went to, I went to South Africa as a child because I have some family there. But um, I've never been to Cape Town, which I hear is amazing. If anyone can concur, it's got some nods yet. <laughs> We've got a South African over there, is it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm over here. Amazing. So um, I've never worked with a South African crew, and so you know, immediate when I was offered the job, like I immediately put my feelers out and I asked producers I know, directors I know, actors I know. Um, I immediately just asked Ian Glenn, who's just been out there working on a show called Raker. Um, and, uh, you know, and they come back and they say, and, and, and as was the case in, here, they went, oh, South African crews are amazing. South African crews are great. And when you're shooting, um, your experience is, yes, it's about your co-stars and it's about who's standing next to you, but almost more it's to do with the people at the other side of the camera. 
it's to do with the camera guy and the, the boom operator and the catering dudes and the sparks. And it's, you know, it's um, you guys, when you see an actor, you know, what we're looking back at is basically 50 people when we're acting who are all busy doing their own jobs. And those people and the stories and the richness that they bring to your life when you interact with them and they become your family if you do a show for, a, you know, if you go and do Game of Thrones or something, you see those same people for six years, eight years, 10 years, if you're Kit and Amelia, you know, it's, so it becomes this amazing experience and you learn about a part of the world, you know, and I've been to Dubai and I've been to Australia and I've been, spent time in Los Angeles and I've been to Canada and I'm about to go to Africa and I've been in Budapest and, the beauty, and I've shot films in the south of France, and you know, this is the beauty, is you get, you get to interact with people from all over the world. There's always a slightly different vibe. People always do things slightly different. And so you just have this incredible traveling life experience at the same time as doing the job. So returning then to your acting journey to 2007, 2008, you're playing Anne Boleyn in The Tudors, to mm -hmm. much acclaim. And you've said in previous interviews that you are, and I quote, interested in playing women who feel real, who are fighting for something or desire something or are scared. Mm -hmm. Did that draw you to the role of Anne Boleyn or do you think that realising that you like playing women like that, you discovered through this role in Anne Boleyn? Well, she was one of the first. So if there looks like there's a manifesto through my work, I mean, it really sort of starts, I suppose, with, with, with lead roles, with protagonist roles. You know, it starts around Anne would be my first. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was, I, I needed the job. I hadn't worked for a while and it just felt like the universe was giving me a gift. I loved history so much. When I read more about her, I was just so impressed with her. And um, such an interesting time in um, English history as well. The Reformation, I mean, for God's sake, you know, literally. <laughs> 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 um, so, you know, to, to play such a prominent figure in, in history, a real person that lived and breathed and, the, you know, and to read all those books, those, all about those biographies and try and work out where Starkey said one thing and Antonia Frazier said another. But at the end of the day, your script is your Bible. You have to adhere to your script. So if your writer has written Anne Boleyn as a complete, you know, B-I-T-C-H, then you have to play her that way because that's what he's written. And if he's written her as a heroine, then you have to follow, the, you, you know, your, your, your script is your text, is your Bible. So then you sort of, when you're playing a historical figure or a real figure, you have to try and weave in or suggest and try and nudge towards what you think the true characterization should be, either in line with or against your text. Um, and that's to do with quality of the writing and what they're trying to achieve. Did you feel and do you think that actors feel a greater responsibility I felt when a profound, playing historical? Yes, I, found, I've, I felt a profound responsibility when playing Anne. And I'm sure other actresses that have played Anne would feel the same because she was so vilified. Henry, Henry had such a campaign to completely eradicate her existence after he executed her that she was, you know, completely, her legacy is completely victimized by that, historically being whitewashed. And I, I always think that you can work out really kind of what kind of woman Anne Boleyn was by what kind of woman Elizabeth I was. You know, nature and versus nurture. You know, you think you go, well, Elizabeth I was pretty strong, formidable, you know, intelligent chick. So I'm sure some of it was in the blood. <laughs> Does that responsibility in the time you invest into a character give you a sense of ownership and care for that period of time and that thing? If you're reading about the Tudors now and see something about Anne Boleyn, do you get defensive? Do you feel like yes, she's I do. me? Yes, I do. But it wears off after a couple of decades. <laughs> um, it's a really pertinent question, and I, I fully agree with everything you're suggesting. Yes. Um, I've, I just had the experience of playing another real person. Um, I played um, a pediatric oncologist called Dr. Audrey Evans um, in, for a, in an independent film that's being cut as we speak in Philadelphia last autumn. And 
this woman was alive when I started the film and she passed during our shooting of it. And I got to meet her once and literally hold her hand on her deathbed, which was a profound privilege. Because hopefully you'll see the film, guys, but she, um, she was a trailblazer in children's cancer and in the specific area of neuroblastoma. Um, during the course of her career, and because of what she did, she invented something that's called the Evans staging system, which the staging system of cancer for now, now is still loosely based on. In the 60s, this is. The film is set in the 60s when she took up her, her residency at CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And she, when she arrived at CHOP, 75 to 80% of children that were coming through those doors were dying. And by the time she left because of what she did. She was a chemotherapy specialist. And by, by the time she retired, thanks to her revolutionary um, forward thinking in chemotherapy and the work that she'd done with, in radiology, with her radiology partner as well, by the time she left, 80% survival rate. That's incredible. So to play her as a film that is literally a eulogy as she's leaving this world. Never since Anne have I felt such a responsibility to do justice to a human being that they be recognized fully. And yeah, you, I think you wear it in a different way when it's a real person. I do believe that, yes. How different is it then working on things like the small independent film you just talked about or historical TV show like The Tudors to going into the mass industrial media CGI operations of Captain America, The Hunger Games, I suppose a little bit later Game of Thrones. Was that a massive shift for you, being thrown into Captain America, Marvel World, massive budgets, um, lots of CGI, lots of makeup and prep time? Yeah, well, like I said, every day is different and every job is different. I think, you know, when you're doing a day on Captain America, you're just a tourist. It's sort of come in, say your lines, be nice to everyone and leave. <laughs> um, and... I, I, again, I would say it's where my training stood me in good stead because if you're, if, you're, if you're reassured that at the end of the day you know what it is to form a characterization and a believable, realistic characterization, say your lines, who is it that said say your lines and don't trip over the furniture? I think it's allocated to different people at different times. but. Um, I think it, maybe Olivier said it, I don't know. Um, it is kind of that simple. Come in and do your job, do it well, do it to the best of your ability, don't upset too many people, and, and, you know, and, and leave. And um, if you're a day player on Captain America, you walk in, you shoot those two scenes like I did or whatever in one day, or you dedicate six years of your life to a show like Game of Thrones, and sometimes there'll be massive green screen and CGI, and you'll be wading through water or going to like semi-automatic weapons training, which is, you know, great. <laughs> um, or, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, you'll be learning how to handle and in pretend to inject mice like I was on the Audrey film. And you'll be, so you kind of, acting, I think I have said this before in an interview, act, acting's kind of cheating insofar as you get multiple lives for one. You find yourself in situations and doing things that you would never ordinarily have thought you would do. I learned to scuba dive because I had to do a car crash scene. And then that went on to you know, mean that I became an advanced scuba diver and I've had many enjoyable holiday, but I probably wouldn't have had that idea myself unless I had been trained to use a regulator for that car crash scene. Why did you need to use a regulator for a car crash scene? Because the car <laughs> crashed and we went underwater. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't, I explain, I I didn't it, explain that. I probably Sorry. could have worked that one out, I think. <laughs> um, 
So um, I will only ask ten, five, ten minutes more worth of questions before I open up to the audience. Okay. Um, so let's move on to Game of Thrones. Um, I'm sure you're bored. Tiny to death show, of, tiny <laughs> show. No one watched it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're bored to death of talking about it. Um, but had you read the Song of Ice and Fire book series before you auditioned for the role as Marjorie? No, I hadn't. And I, you know, I came in in the second season. So the phenomenon was nowhere near a phenomenon when I came on board that ship. It was the next sort of like two, three years that it became what it became. And I don't think any of us really knew what it was. And, you know, until right in the zeitgeist of when we were in it. And then it was, you know, perfect for me because I left before the very end, so. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we have questions on that coming. <laughs> So I escaped that. I really, I really, I won the lot. I won the lottery on that show. I got in, did five years' work, left. Um, and I, I chose not to read the books because um, I realised that Dan and David were going to go in a different direction, and there wasn't. <laughs> Taking myself a hole here. I don't have to defend them anymore. They don't pay me anymore. <laughs> um, and, you know, Marjorie wasn't a major character in the books. She wasn't fleshed out. George hadn't fleshed her out. I mean, that's literally what they said to me when they gave me the role. They were like, we don't know what to do with her. <laughs> so you look like you have some ideas. So I was like, not really, but I'll do what you tell me to do. Um, so... Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Had you read the books before? I you? haven't read the books. No. Have and I'm since? normally quite, and as, you, as you've just worked out from Anne Boleyn or something, or, you know, I will do my due diligence and my research if I think it's appropriate. Sometimes it's an advantage not to, especially if it's a beloved, you know, especially if it's beloved text in another form. So. Have you since read the books? No. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, they won't be finished rather than being Well, I was going to say, is George finished them? I don't think George has finished them. So you didn't feel any additional pressure, like you did with the historical characters, to fulfil a character that people have read the books and liked? And... May, not because, not out of lack of respect for the book acolytes, not out of a lack of respect, purely because I felt at that time it wouldn't help me do my job better. In fact, if anything, I thought it might under, undermine my process. So that's why I took that decision. Mm -hmm. Did you like the Marjorie that you ended up creating with mm -hmm. Dan and I, yeah, I mean, I felt like, I felt at the time, I felt like Marjorie was being willfully misunderstood and misinterpreted. But maybe that's just because I was so close to the characterization that, you know, um, of course I loved her. It's a very interesting one. I'll, I'll, we'll wait until that's open to the floor, I think, before I start making assumptions about what you all think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this question was asked at Charles last term. Who was the best to work with on the set of Game of Thrones? Who was your favourite person to be in a scene with, or the person you looked at and thought, I wish Marjorie had a scene with them? Oh, well, I love Rory. I loved the Hound. And if I bumped into him at the airport, I was very happy. <laughs> so I wish I could have had a scene with him. And then other than that, the most fun... I mean, I loved working with Jonathan as the Sparrow. I learned a lot because that's a man who has so many awards and so many different mediums that what he doesn't know isn't worth learning. He did a seminal Hamlet when he was younger. Um, he's an incredible stage actor and um, he's just done it. He's lived it, breathed it. Dame Diana is, you know, rig is rig, you know, it's like... <laughs> So you're honoured to be on screen with her. It was such an eclectic mix. The joy of the job was that you never quite knew who you were going to be opposite next season. You know, that was the joy of the job. And so um, it changed. It changed year on year, you know. As well as people that you looked at and thought, I want to act alongside them, were there roles that you looked at and thought, oh, God, I wish I was Daenerys, or I wish no. I was Cersei? No, I never... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lena, yeah, no. Um, no, because like I said to you, I had the best of both worlds. I could... If my role in Game of Thrones had been bigger, I would never have been able to go and do The Hunger Games 
or you have to dedicate so much of your time to those, those more prevalent roles. So I had this beautiful, like, you know, I had this, this beautiful experience for three, four years where I was one on one of the most successful shows in television, but I also had six months of the year off to go and pursue other jobs, be it stage or, you know, smaller projects. So I, you know, I, I was literally grateful that the equation was, was, so, was so wonderful for me. Did that mean that after the years you spent on Game of Thrones, it was difficult to move on? In, what do you mean? Um, was, it, was it sad when you realised that Marjorie was dying? Uh, I was champing at the bit to get out, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, because... Please kill me off, please Well, <laughs> you know, I've, I've said this in other interviews before. Um, I'd asked Dan and David to do a stage play the year before, a, a George Bernard Shaw, and... Um, it had overlapped with Game of Thrones shooting by like two, three days. Mm -hmm. And so because of the mechanics, as you rightly said, of that machine, it, the mechanics of that machine, the number of actors involved, the number of locations, I mean, there's just no way they're going to try and work out an actor's schedule for that show. So the answer was no, you can't. And I was really quite upset mm -hmm. at the time. And they phoned me. And they said, don't worry, Nat. You know, we don't normally tell people this, but you'll be free next year. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK. But it means I had the advantage over a lot of my colleagues that I, I, I sort of could start planning. <laughs> Did you see colleagues sat in, like, a first reading of, a, of, of an episode, and that would be when they realised that their character died? Or No, because there would be a table read... Um, but that didn't always happen and not everyone could be there and in, invariably people would die later in later episodes in the show and uh, people are reading that like quietly in their bedroom, you know, so we didn't really see that, no. Is it a strange atmosphere to have so many people you work with for, um, like Dame Dan, for across several series and then suddenly you don't work with them anymore? Or is that just part and parcel of the job of being an actor that you have? It's kind of part and, part, part and parcel, and it makes us sound a bit unfeeling or mercenary, but um, that's the job. It's the troubadour lifestyle. It's the circus family. You go somewhere, you bond, you have an incredible time. There's ups, there's downs. It's a chapter in your life, and you go on, you know? And that's whether it's, you know an independent film, a TV show, or a stage. So, no, it's, it's always sad, but you spend your life saying hello and goodbye to people, so I suppose you learn to get, you learn to get good at it. Or, you know, <laughs> or you find your, the love of your life <laughs> on a job. Um, obviously, Kit and Rose ended up together after Game of Thrones. David and I met each other on stage doing Venus in Fur. And, uh, you know, and now have a daughter and a life together. So you don't say goodbye to everyone. <laughs> Do you have a favourite memory from Game of Thrones? Favourite memory? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, the purple wedding w was, you know, we were all together as a cast for like four or five days in Croatia. It was like a f big frat sorority union party. <laughs> um, because so many of the scenes in GOT are two people talking or three people talking, but normally, you know, just two people in a room or, you know, and so on and so forth. Those, un those unlikely couplings that the show was so very good at. So for us all to be, you know, shooting a big party scene and to be, you know, there was like 10 or 12 lead characters all there. Um, we all had a fun week. Um, now, I gather from your previous comments that you have seen the seasons after Marjorie's death. Um, and, and I'm not responsible for them. And, uh, <laughs> and um, don't worry about being polite. Charles Dance certainly wasn't. Um, oh, but, what did Charles say? Um, well, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice plug. Um, but, but no, it um, was, was, not, was not polite. Um, what did you think of season eight? Is it where you thought they were going? Do you think it's where they thought they were going? Um, <laughs> a 
huge disclaimers here. Um, okay, I think this is the perfect example of people, if the, if the, if the IP does not, the inter, if the inter, sorry, you, Oxford, do I, I don't have to explain what IP is. <laughs> If the intellectual property is already there from start to finish, like we were talking about Lord of the Rings upstairs, um, then an awful lot of work has been done by Tolkien or Hemingway or Jane Austen or so many man hours has been done in creating the structure of that story. And if it's a novel, it's been through its editors and its publishers, it's been refined and refined and refined. And, um, you know, or various versions of that. The story has been stress tested. Um, if that story, a three act story from start to finish has already existed and is given an adaptation. When you are watching shows or and it's normally shows because a, a, a film script will be commissioned, obviously having been fully written 100 pages, 110 pages as is standard, 90 to 110 pages, depending. Um, you know, you've got your three act structure, start to finish, this is the film. They commission TV shows without always knowing what the ending is. You may have noticed. <laughs> Sometimes they know what the first two seasons are, but, and sometimes they know what the first five seasons are. But I think, you know, what an audience doesn't always understand is the number of cooks in the kitchen of the studio and um, what the writers are up and the showrunners are up against. There are many, many layers of opinion. Um, and not least actors' contracts. They want to get out of contracts. They've been doing this job for eight, nine years. They want to go and do something else. There's so many layers to the industry that the audience don't care. Of course you don't care about it, and you shouldn't care about because you're just watching your story that you want to watch for escapism and to take you away. But there's elements of the business that get in the way. Literally, you know, the price tag and people's contracts and at the other end is, you know, those stories that have already been written by greats. There are a reason why those stories are great. And, and they've been fully thought out and fully rounded. David and Dan did not have that. I am defending them. Maybe it's just... Well, who has a better may, story than Bran the Broken? May, maybe, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's just, maybe I don't... I empathise. I was, dis I, I was disappointed, I was, but I also fully appreciate what they must have been up against. And I think it would have almost been an impossible job for everyone, to, for most, for the majority of people to be satisfied because it was so beloved, that show, and people bonded with their characters that they adored the most so intensely, which is when we're doing our job well. And it's what storytelling should be. It should be cathartic. It should transform you know, your life momentarily and take you away. People are so emotionally invested in all that plethora of characterization. How were you ever, ever going to satisfy everyone? Or most people. I don't, it's really tough. Has it? Was that really Was that an unsatisfying <laughs> answer? Um, a dissatisfying answer? You can it, argue with me about it later. Has it changed your, has it sort of slightly stained your experience of the show and your years <laughs> on it? Knowing that all the characters you interacted with, you now know what the ending is? No. Stained? No, 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 no. Because I was in there, I was in it, breathing it, doing what was right in that moment for my character at that moment. And like I said, the actor's job as a character, as to be, when playing a character and actually in your career should be to be in the moment. So when I was in the moment, I was having a ball. And then, you know, and then after that, I'm not the actor anymore. I join your ranks and I become the audience member and I'm detached from that. 
I don't equate those, those two emotions. They're separate identities. Penultimate question from me. Um, it's more of a sort of question of personal curiosity about what it's like to be uh, an actor in a um, massive sort of cult fan show. When Mark Hamill came to the union in 2016, he was met by sort of 20 or 30 people in the chamber who came in Jedi robes with lightsabers and was then asked sort of uh, by some audience members hard-hitting fan questions about mm. you know, certain parts of Star Wars law, etc. Is it strange being involved in a show where for you it's a job, it's a period in your life, it's um, uh, something you enjoy doing, but it's an acting job, and yet there are thousands and thousands of people out there for whom it is a significant part of their life who will know every sort of second detail and will ask and expect you to sort of be the character rather than just the person who played them on screen? Well, that's a different question, what you tagged on at the end there. That's a <laughs> two and one. There's two and one there. <laughs> no, I don't begrudge. No, um, that's the job. And at the end of the day, because people feel so passionately about stories that they watch or listen to or attend in the theater is the reason that i'm employed and i get to have fun doing the passion of you know i get to actually live my dream and act for a living and i'm i'm so grateful to the audience for that because i couldn't do that without you it's such a weird creative job a musician can pick up a guitar on their own in a room and a painter can sit at their easel and paint but an actor needs you. And if we don't have you, we drink a lot. <laughs> um, so the fact that I get to explore my creative, that I get to explore my creative um, instincts and hopes within the dirty mercenary world of show business, mm -hmm and try and, you know, try and reconcile that because art versus commerce is always, you know, the fight. But over and above that, the fact that I get to do what I love to do, I would never begrudge an audience member feeling one way or the other about a piece or a project ever. Um, when Dame Diana Rigg died, most of her obituaries, I, I, I'm guessing all, the ones I read, all said the Avengers. And if, you know, it was a very important role in so far as it was a particular time in the 60s and she was seen as a feminist character and Diana would never poo-poo that character. But she spent a li very limited amount of time playing it. If you look at what well, I can't remember what it is, I should have checked before I'd come, um, in case you asked a question along these lines. But I don't think it was more than a couple of years that she mm. played that role. And she was a Tony Award winning, Olivia winning, BAFTA winning. Mm. She never got the Oscar, but she was, you know, a tour de force stage primarily and screen actor. And she was Avengers, Day and Diana Rigg. Mm. And is that fair? No. Is it what happens? Yes. So I just, I'm grateful, be grateful for, to have those populist roles, be grateful for the opportunities they give you. If I hadn't played Marjorie Terrell, I would not be handed the gift of playing Dr. Audrey Evans, who dedicated her life to sa saving children and did some pretty other cool stuff as well that I hope people will watch because they wouldn't have got funding for the film with me playing her if I hadn't been Marjorie. So it's all, it's all, it's all give and take. And you have to think of it as a holistic whole which is easier the, the older you get. <laughs> I feel like a shameless plug, um, but Dame Diana Rigg did come to the Union in 2018 and the video's on our YouTube channel as well. well there you go. Um, uh, final question from me, what's next for Natalie Dormer? If you're allowed to say, what are you working on in South Africa and beyond? So I just finished um, Audrey's Children, which is obviously this wonderful, um, stunning movie about this trailblazing, be trailblazing beautiful woman 
who was a Brit, even though she went to America, because she couldn't get a position as a doctor in London in the late 50s as a woman. Now, I'm sure that doesn't surprise any of you, but so she had to go to America, the land of opportunity, as it was definitely then in gender politics back then. And then I just went straight onto a movie called The Wasp, myself and Naomi Harris. That was a play first, written by Morgan Lloyd Malcolm. Um, it had been at the Hampstead and then it transferred, so we just made a movie out of it, which is sort of a great psychological thriller. And uh, I'm about to go to South Africa and start a show called Dark Hearts, which is, a, again, a sort of drama thriller about an investigative journalist who lives in Cape Town. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. That's got lots of layers, quite a big cast in that one as well. So. And do you know what you're doing beyond that, or is that...? Having a break. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. I'm, uh, I, now, I now walk the line of being a working mother, so mm -hmm. I have a two-year-old. So to have done two films in a row before Christmas and to be going on to a three-month job, um, you know, I go home now and David says, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh, if any of you have any questions, please raise your uh, membership cards now, and then one of our team will come to a microphone. Um, the gentleman in the scarf who was the first to have his hand up. It pays to be quick. Someone got a yeah, you mic. Thank you. Um, so for obvious reasons, it's, it's a very lucrative business to kind of make a sequel of a, a movie or a TV show that you already know, you know did well. Um, case in point, like Avengers number 32 or, um, I don't know. But do you think that that phenomena has been um, decreasing the, I guess, money that's going into other films that might not necessarily have the same history? Uh, history? Yes. Um... You know, we're in very tight times at the moment, aren't we? And the film industry, independent film industry, is no different. So there's been cuts in funding um, for independent films. Um, and it's really, really, really tough for young artists. BAFTA does what it can. The BFI does what it can. There's lots of funds and so forth. But truly, it's a difficult time to be a young aspiring filmmaker or... But the beauty of technology now is you really can roll up your sleeves and go out and make something, you know? And with the software on your computer as well, it's like if, I've got, if there are any as aspiring directors in this room, I would say don't wait to be invited. Start, start putting it together yourself, you know? Find your little crew, call in every favor you can, you know, use one of your parents' house, ask the local pub landlord if you can shoot in, you know, after hours, just pull and, you know, find a young, aspiring kind of producers and just, just do it. Because the sooner you start learning how to do it and budget it, then, um, you know, you'll wear, you'll wear that experience and um, hopefully it'll be easier to gain funding and make something original if you can show we did this, if that kind of, if that makes sense. Uh, next question, please. We'll go to the honorable member in the front row here in the, it's about to say the scarf, but half of you are wearing scarves. Sorry, it's so cold in here. Um, yeah, so I've been shaking a bit. You all might have noticed, <laughs> trying, to, trying to keep it under control. <laughs> As you mentioned earlier, you were talking about how there are some well-rounded characters already. Um, what was it like playing Moriarty in elementary? What was it like playing her? Yeah. Well, I think again, it's sort of like um, you're aware of you're aware of history and all the different interpretations of Moriarty sitting on your shoulder, and so you try not to think about that too much. Um, I mean, it's just a joy. I mean, Johnny Lee Miller's interpretation of Sherlock was so special and unique that you just try to, f and again, it's about, what's in the, it's about what's in the script. It's what the writer has already chosen her to be. 
So I got that job thinking that I was just playing I Irene. I didn't know that I was Moriarty. I literally signed the contract and, and they said, and you're not just Adler, you're also Moriarty. And I went, oh, cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I love those original books. There, you know, that, charact that characterization of Sherlock Holmes that Conan Doyle did is, has been regurgitated in so many forms. Oh, the anti-hero, you know, sort of, you saw it in House, that show. And um, it comes up again and again because it's such, as an arch almost as an archetype character, the, the crazed, you know, haunted genius. It's, it's sort of started there. With, um, and those characters reappear because they're so well, the original intellectual property has been so well done in the first place. And that's why they stand the test of time. Next question, we'll go to the member right here at the pink hair. Uh, good evening, Natalie, and thank you so much for coming in to talk thank to us you. today. Um, just following on from uh, what you were talking about with um, Tim Tannenrig and all the obituaries mentioning her role in the, in the Avengers, um, if you were to choose one project for which you would be remembered, remembered. the most... <laughs> you just know my obituary is going to say Game of Thrones is an athlete <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, well, I'll, I'll suck it up like Dame Diana did. You know, it gave me a massive bump in my career and Marjorie will be there. Um, uh, I'm going to say something quite controversial now and say I hope that those are ahead of me because I've worked really hard for, you know, 17, 18 years to get to this place in my career and now I feel like I can be very discerning about what I choose in the next 20 years of my career. And I'm really hoping that, um, you know, something that challenges me beyond what I could even fathom right now will come along. Um, so I'm looking to the horizon, my love. Um, we'll go to the member at the back with the membership card in the aisle. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, just because you mentioned in the interview, like there are different, it's like the training system from the UK is different from the US. How do you say is the difference from like in the film industry between UK and US? For example, like the funding structure, uh, like the funding structure and also like, um, for example, the direct, like the, the overall system. And also a second question is like, how do you think Brexit is going to affect like the film industry in the UK? Because I heard in fashion a lot of shooting. Hang on, I'm sorry, I'm finding it difficult to hear you. Oh, darling. sorry. Um, so, because you mentioned the training system is totally different from UK and US. How do you say like the film industry, well, how do you see the difference between the film industry in the UK and the US? And for example, the funding structure and also like probably the focus of the film industry. And also, um, that second question is, how do you think Brexit is going to affect the future of the film industry? How is Brexit going to affect? The future of the film industry. Oh, I mean, it already has. Hugely, because, um, but I mean, they've worked, they, they worked it out because it immediately, um, it affected visas immediately. I said to you before, as a British actor, I had worked in Budapest, in, you know, in the south of France, in, you know, in Spain, in um, I Ireland. I mean, I don't need to fill in those gaps for you. It makes everything much, much, much difficult. And for crews as well. Um, actors can tend to take bigger gaps between... Actors can tend to take bigger gaps between their jobs, but jobbing crews, they just want to work... They need to work all the time. So that was... You know, it's very hard for them too. Um, yes, of course, the independent film industry in Britain needs much, much more finance. Of course it does. But my God, get to the nurses first. I, I mean, we live in really austere, horrific times. And, um, but having said that, I do, you know, people, people need escapism as well. It's, it's medicine, it helps. Um, but we're, we are very American-minded in this country because so much of the financing of our... Sh I think because we share a language, it's so easy to um, obviously transport a show 
either direction of the Atlantic, so it immediately interweaves our two industries. Well, uh, the American industry and the British industry. But we box above our weight because we have such talented crews and talented, and talented talent. That's what they call us actors. They call us the talent. Um, I know, it's nice, isn't it? Um, and so, you know, a lot of people feel it's not like um, Spain or France that they have their own subsidized system that supports the creative artists. You know, Brits, I think, get to a point where they start banging their head and they think the only way that they can graduate is to go to America. And I think that personally, I think that's sad. I think we should have our own sufficient industry within Britain. I mean, we do really in TV. You guys know the shows that are British shows and the shows, and they're British shows that are then sold to America, that America loves. But then there's also great shows that are American shows shot in Britain. There's lots of different, the new, S, the new SVOD landscape means that there's no singular rule anymore about how a show is financed or sold. It's also sort of the Wild West at the moment. There's lots of different versions of how a show can be financed and how it can be sold internationally. So it's hard to talk in absolutes about it, but it is very, what I can tell you is it's very much in flux because it's on the back of this digital revolution. Like Game of Thrones was probably one of the biggest TV show, well, it was the biggest TV show 10 years ago, you know, eight years ago. But now shows of that size are everywhere. And so you're like, this isn't sustainable. It's certainly not financially sustainable. So I think we live in a very particular, interesting time of like, what's gonna happen? The number of platforms that are all asking you guys to subscribe your eight pounds a month. Like it's not possible to have everything. So it will, I think, reduce down ultimately because it's an overcrowded market space. Um, but like it's in flux at the moment, who knows? I mean, what does everyone, does there, who has Netflix? <laughs> Who has Amazon Prime? Who has Apple? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Who has all three? Disney Plus. Ah, I see, that's interesting. Mm. And it is show business. And, act, and I could sit here and talk to you about character and um, my internal process and I mean, I, I could for, for hours and bore you all to tears um, about my emotional journeys as an actor. That's my, that's my job, that's my bread and butter, that's my due diligence, but I also know that what I am in is an industry. Um, and um, it's a business. And, uh, you know, like I said before, you have to try and balance those two things when you, when you pick a job. Do we have time for one or maybe two more questions? Goes to the member here in the American flag sweatshirt. Uh, I guess that acting is a very totalizing emotional experience. So I'm wondering, talking about kind of methods and stuff, do you ever find it difficult switching from being the character that you play on a given day and then just going home, having a coffee, and then being yourself again? Um, and a second, a bit more amusing, I guess, question. Do you have any, any particularly weird or kind of funny um, fan encounter stories that you would like to share with the chamber? Any what stories? Fan encounter, any, uh, fan encounter fan stories. Fan encounter yeah. stories. Actually, your first question, yes, absolutely, and you learn to get better at it. Um, uh, if you're doing a particularly... I had this really interesting phenomenon when I was playing Miss Julie in After Miss Julie, and I'd been playing it for, you know, six, seven weeks, and then, then the show closed. And I found myself on the couch um, watching TV for, like, the next week. And around 9, 9.30, when I was just at home on my couch, I sort of suddenly felt really down and really sad and, um, like, really quite depressed and dark. And then it took me like two or three days to work out that that was the time of day every day for the last month and a half, half that I had been walking off stage to commit suicide. 
And it's like my body was just anticipating that emotional reaction at that time of the night, every night. I found that so interesting. And it took a while for the residue to leave me and for that to, dis and that to disappear off. The film that I just did with Naomi Harris before Christmas is very, very dark in places. It's highly entertaining <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> and quite fun. It's still entertaining at the end, but in a different way. That's the skill of Morgan's work, but it goes to a particularly dark place that you're not anticipating. Um, it's a two-hander because it's a play, so it's just her and me, her and me, her and me for five weeks. And, um, you know, I'm very lucky to have a partner who's an actor who understands because I, was, I, I went to a dark place. And that's the first time in my life, you know, coming home, needing some quiet time, needing to go have a bath, needing to go and shake the character off, shake the day off. It's the first time I've had to do it whilst being a mother. And it really made me think about it because I have no right taking that energy when I've been playing what I've been playing. And when you watch The Wasp, you'll understand. And I have no business taking that into my daughter's nursery. So I think as you get older as an actor and you have responsibilities towards people and family members, then you get to be less, I, can't, I want to say indulgent, it's not the right word, but the process, you can't, you have to have a slightly different, rela different relationship with it, I think, um, in order to function and adhere to your responsibilities on the other side of, you know, the other door. And fun stories. Fine. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen what a Comic-Con looks like, but my <laughs> God. What I always found so amazing, and you know, obviously the pandemic took those away, and I haven't been to any for a, bin for a very long time, but when you find fans standing in front of you that wearing costumes, like down to the beading, <sighs> down to like the button, have studied so profoundly and in depth, you know, your character's costume, or the makeup, or the hair, I mean, it's such a compliment, not just to me, but also to the hair artist and the costume designer and the so on and the so forth. That dedication, you're talking about Mark Hamill, like that dedication to have it stand in front of you and get to interact with that level of passion. Um, that's, that was just a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we don't have time for any more questions, I'm afraid, except for the last question which we ask all of our speakers, mm -hmm. which is, if you could give one piece of advice to the members of the Oxford Union and the students of the University of Oxford, what would that piece of advice be in a couple of sentences? When you are 30, don't hold yourself to your dreams of, your, of being 20. And when you're 40, don't hold yourself to the dreams of what you expected for yourself when you're 30. You will change, you will grow, you will shift. When you sit in interviews, people will quote things you said 15 years ago to a self that you don't really remember very well anymore. We all are in constant movement. We're constantly changing. And especially in this time of social media, when so much of your teenagehood and your 20s is going to be documented there for people to call back and put in your faces, Release yourself of that. We all grow and we all shift and we all change and you will be different people. And, a lot, and your ambitions and your hopes and your passions will change. Some will remain, but some will change. So take that pressure off yourself to fulfill the dreams of your 18-year-old self because it might not be appropriate. And happiness is ultimate and contentment in the moment is ultimately what you're looking for, to be a healthy human being. So strive, you're all overachievers, that's why you're in this room. Strive, but be affected by your environments and your experiences and grow and change, is what I would say. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking you.